is Nightline with Michael Usher. Good evening, week three of the election campaign and there's been some encouraging news for the Prime Minister and the Coalition. The latest news poll figures to be published in tomorrow's Australian newspaper have shown the government have clawed back some lost ground. In the primary vote, the Coalition is up four points to 42%, Labor down three to 48 They're the best figures for the government since Kevin Rudd took over the Labor leadership last December. And there's also been a significant narrowing of the gap in the two-party preferred vote, with the coalition now at 46%, 8% behind Labor. That is the closest it's been all year. Meanwhile, jobs and the environment were the key issues on the campaign trail today. Kevin Rudd revealed a $200 million plan to protect the Great Barrier Reef, while John Howard promised to build 100 new technical colleges throughout Australia. Students at St Joseph's College in the Melbourne suburb of Ferntree Gully gave John Howard an enthusiastic reception today. Hello. Hello there. But a few minutes into a Prime Ministerial speech and a lot of that enthusiasm had evaporated. Kevin Rudd was in North Queensland enjoying himself playing farmer. Good to go from Burn. The Prime Minister's focus was jobs and skills training. 100 additional technical colleges throughout Australia over the next 10 years with an investment of $10.1 billion. Well, not quite. It was an ambitious pledge, but the investment will be $2.1 billion, not 10. Mr Howard says it's the latest element in a comprehensive plan to drive Australia's unemployment rate down to 3%. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Mr Rudd, his priority the environment, took a cruise to Green Island off Cairns for his big event of the day. So today we're announcing a $200 million plan to protect the Great Barrier Reef. $146 million of that will be used for grants to farmers to reduce nutrient and sediment runoff, which affects water quality around the reef and damages ecosystems. But the two issues, the environment and jobs, came together in a row over whether Australia should commit to new greenhouse gas reduction targets under the Kyoto Protocol, even if China and other developing countries decline to do so. Shadow Environment Minister Peter Garrett aroused the Prime Minister's ire Thank by you. revealing that a Labor government would not consider it a deal breaker if developing nations refused to sign up to reduction targets immediately. That is a, a plan uh, not for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's a plan for reducing Australian jobs. Mr Rudd replied that if countries like Australia and the US took the lead, China would eventually follow. It is stunning after all these years that Mr Howard, anchored in old thinking, anchored in the past, refuses to accept this challenge of the future. Laurie Oaks for Nightline. Okay, and there'll be another election debate tomorrow. Not the leaders, it's Treasurer Peter Costello this time up against his Labor counterpart Wayne Swan. And you can see it live on all these stations with Ray Martin tomorrow afternoon from 12.30 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The worm will be there with its verdict revealed in tomorrow night's news bulletins. Well, the final journey home has begun for SAS Sergeant Matthew Locke his mates held a special ceremony at the Tarrant Cout base in southern Afghanistan as his casket was carried on an Australian transport plane for the flight home. Sergeant Locke was killed in a firefight with the Taliban last Thursday. His body is expected in Perth on Wednesday. Much of southeast Queensland is cleaning up tonight after being belted by severe storms. The worst affected areas were to the south of Brisbane in the Bow Desert region and the hardest hit was Richmond Court at Munroobin where every property was damaged. People here are divided over whether to call it a tornado or cyclone but they all agree it was 10 terrifying minutes of destruction that left just about everyone in Munroobin's Richmond Court with a story to tell. It's just wrecked the place. It's, everything is just gone. It started with a bang just before eight. A crack of lightning cut power, then rain and winds gusting over 100 kilometres an hour tore through. Several trees have come down and caused mass devastation in this street. Two of those trees came down on Alan and Carol Powell's house. Too dangerous even for the SES to try an emergency patch up. So we'll just have a no go zone through here, guys. What the trees didn't ruin, the rain did, and daylight didn't improve the view. Worse, because at night you don't see everything because we had no power, and then you get up in the morning and go, oh. Daybreak brought more storms. That led to this in neighbouring Cedar Grove. The result of not one, but two lightning strikes on Erin Shaw's home, the first hit the power box. 
certainly heart stopping where they are. She ran straight to her two girls still in their bedrooms. Her home was already burning as they fled. The most frightening part was stepping outside because there was still the storm was still in progress and I didn't want the girls to get hit by lightning. Their newly renovated home and everything inside was destroyed. But Erin got out with her two most important possessions. I guess it's the end of a dream, but the dream of my girls is a bigger dream. For those who can rebuild, it will be a long process. 11-year-old Andrew Micklav was home alone at Greenbank while his parents checked their horses when the roof disappeared. Scary. It's like going to get blown away. As stunned as they are by the events of last night, there's also disbelief that for all this destruction, there have been no human casualties. I mean, this is all replaceable. Bodies aren't. Back in Richmond Court, the cleanup will take days. They're all chipping in. Big men, little men, big shovels, a big job to do. Matt Dunstan for Nightline. And storms in South Australia have claimed the life of a 12-year-old girl in Wyala. Deanna Sherry was in a churchyard getting ready for Sunday school when she was crushed by a tree, which was blown over by winds estimated at 70 kilometres an hour. An eight-year-old girl was also hit by branches, suffering a broken leg. In an Australian first, the Victorian government will introduce new laws this week to protect children from life-threatening allergies. The move comes just a week after the sudden death of mobile phone tycoon John Ilhan, who set up a foundation in response to his young daughter's allergy to nuts. Nigel and Martha Baptist have been fighting for this day for three years, ever since their eldest son Alex died from a severe reaction to peanuts at his local kindergarten. Today is a very, very happy day for us. And today, having the legislation, to us, we see that as Alex's legacy, you know, if not Alex's law. The legislation that we'll introduce will make it compulsory for training programs to be put in place to ensure that staff are trained in each of those institutions to deal with children who have an anaphylactic uh, problem. Each school must also have the appropriate medication and adrenaline injection and a plan to deal with an allergic reaction. Where there is a reaction, parents must be contacted immediately. Lack of training was definitely an issue. Uh, we, that was really Alex's big chance of being saved and so training is just so important. It's a move welcomed by the Ilhan Food Allergy Foundation. The deceased businessman passionate about the issue after his daughter Jada was diagnosed with a nut allergy. 4,000 children across Victoria are anaphylactic. These new laws will help ease their parents' anxieties, especially knowing they'll be enforced. Schools who don't comply with the legislation face fines of up to $30,000. We highly support banning of, of nuts and nut products in children's services and early primary school. It's not something we're doing at the moment, but it's something I think we would have an open mind to uh, in the years ahead. Caroline Rondo for Nightline. 41 years after Ronald Ryan was hanged in Melbourne, there are plans for family reasons to exhume the body of the last man to be executed in Australia. But the daughter of the prison warder, Ryan, shot dead while escaping is angry. She wasn't consulted before the state government granted permission. Carol Price wasn't prepared for the news this morning that the man convicted of killing her father is being allowed to leave jail. Ryan did the crime. You've got to pay your dues. And the, the, the law says he's to be buried within the grounds of the prison. So that's what I think where he should be. Ronald Ryan wasn't sentenced to life in prison, he was sentenced to death. After 41 years of his remains lying in an unmarked grave on the site of Pentridge Prison, his three daughters have successfully applied for them to be exhumed. Their wish for their father to be cremated and his ashes buried beside his late wife who was laid to rest in Portland four years ago. And this will be an opportunity for a little bit of healing, uh, a little bit of peace to come into their lives and the lives of their grandchildren. It's a long time ago and I think on this case I, uh, I lean towards the views of the family. Ryan was the last man in Australia to be executed. There were massive protests against it. His defence lawyer maintains he was innocent. In my opinion, till my last breath, I'll be convinced that Ryan never did it. The exhuming of Ryan's remains could take place as early as this week. DNA testing will be undertaken to ensure they're not the remains of another executed prisoner. Martine Alpins for Nightline. 
Anti-gambling groups are alarmed at suggestions that the New South Wales government is considering granting online betting company Betfair a licence to operate in the state. The racing industry is also angry, saying such a move would cost millions in lost revenue. Operating in Tasmania for 18 months, Betfair allows punters to back a winner or lay a bet on any outcome, including a loss. Racing New South Wales claims the competition would be devastating. The financial effects of the equine influenza crisis would be a teddy bear's picnic compared to the reports today about licensing Betfair. The online agency says Racing New South Wales is overreacting. We don't think that uh, it'll spell the death of New South Wales racing at all. In, indeed, um, probably the contrary. We think that will help stimulate New South Wales racing. The government well, look, agrees. Yeah, people in New South Wales are already using this service, so it's a matter of getting the best deal. Racing New South Wales has accused the government of a major backflip. It's been the leader in keeping betting exchanges out, and all of a sudden, with no consultation of the racing industry, it's considering it. The Australian Racing Board says the integrity of the Betfair system has a basic flaw that increases the threat of race rigging. We shouldn't be creating the, the circumstances in which there's a financial incentive for someone to actually lose. If you talk to um, you know, any of the stewards around the world that have experience in dealing with betting exchanges, um, they will tell you that um, you know, the audit trails that we provide are second to none. Betfair's hoping to snare 5% of the state's betting market within five years. Adam Walters reporting for Nightline. Melbourne's getting ready to kick up its heels when the Flemington Racing Carnival begins with Derby Day on Saturday. While the Melbourne Cup is the highlight, there's plenty happening off the track in the lead-up. Although the Cup Carnival doesn't kick off until Saturday, Flemington has already had a win. The famous Roses have survived yesterday's ferocious wins, proving more than a match for Mother Nature, who'd already thrown down a challenge in the form of a drought. In the Marquee area, what drought? Emirates is again a clear winner and opulence is again the theme of this two-storey trackside palace. An invite here is the most sought after of all the marquee tickets. So much work, so much money and all for just four days of winding and dining with just the occasional glimpse of what's happening on the track. And there was a bit going on there today as workmen put the finishing touches to the new winning post. A mesh of metal which will add a real historical flavour to Flemington. It was at Federation Square, though, where the Cup Carnival was officially launched today. And having to put up with punters screaming for their blood for years, several jockeys have finally succumbed. How's that going? Vlad Jurek was among those to push the blood bank's cause. His is still pumping hard following his Caulfield Cup win on Master O'Reilly. The pair remain favourite for tomorrow week's Melbourne Cup. Um, look, I'd have to say probably one of the internationals, but I think I'm the horse, my bike's the horse to beat. But Jurek could have one less overseas runner to contend with. Scorpion from the Irish stable of Aidan O'Brien pulled up lame from a gallop at Sandown this morning and will have x-rays tomorrow to determine whether it still runs in the Cup. Tony Jones for Nightline. And coming up on Nightline, the Royals targeted in a sex blackmail scam... And the Aria Honours flow for Silverchair. Let's do it! From director Quentin Tarantino. So what's your name? Stuntman Mike. How fast do you like it? Faster! Get ready to fly! Ah! Oh, How hot can you take it? She sure is a striking looking woman. <laughs> Death proof. They just did everything I possibly could to save her. But it destroyed her whole body. It was a total system breakdown. Our precious Annabelle is gone, but please help us to educate other children before it's too late. Please call the number on your screen and become a sponsor today. For just $29 a month, you will help protect 50 children from the dangers of drugs. It's time to keep Aussie kids safe. Allianz offers financial solutions for life's important moments to millions of people around the world. Since 1890, Allianz has provided financial security for families, insurance for cars, insurance for homes, and insurance solutions for businesses, large and small. 
and in Australia, more than 2 million people rely on Allianz for their insurance. Whatever your moment, Allianz gives you the confidence you need. Financial solutions from A to Z. Allianz. With three flights a day from Sydney to Hong Kong, you can move when it suits you. Cathay Pacific connects you to over 120 destinations worldwide. For details, visit cathaypacific.com.au. You're giving me signs that make me wonder. Do you want to be like me or you want to be me? I know I won't get with this one opportunity and I'm not going to spoil If you have something to confess, you spit it out now. Sydney plan to interview Sharks Rugby League star Paul Gallen over an alleged assault last night at a bar in the southern beachside suburb of Cronulla. His alleged victim says the violence was unprovoked. Cameron Davies was celebrating the birth of a friend's child in the early hours of this morning when he says he was attacked outside a Cronulla bar. I'm pretty sore and sorry for myself at the moment. I'm totally unprovoked and there was no need for it. Claiming he was punched three times and eye gouged, the 29-year-old admitting to having, quote, a few words with one of Paul Gallen's mates, and the second rower stepped in. He grabbed me, I tried to push my way, and next thing you know, we're on the ground, I'm, I'm being hit and eye gouged. So far, police have only heard the alleged victim's version of what happened. They'll speak to Gallen within the next 24 hours and will review security vision from outside the bar. Obviously, in these situations, there's always two sides of the story. The Sharks didn't allow Gallen to answer the allegations today, saying the matter is currently with police. However, new CEO Tony Zappia admitted an incident did take place involving pushing and shoving and that Gallen had been drinking. He's certainly uh, feeling a bit sorry for himself, if I can put it that way, but he's still unsure exactly what's been put forward by the other person. The club says if Gallen has done something wrong, action will be taken. Let's remember that Paul at this stage uh, is not guilty of anything. I, I want charges pressed. Alison Langdon reporting for Nightline. A gangland informer who helped Melbourne police capture fugitive drug lord Tony Mockbell could receive a reward of one million dollars. The man provided key evidence that led detectives to Mockbell's hideout in Athens. Gangland kingpin Tony Mockbell may be thousands of kilometres away, but back home debate rages over who will receive the one million dollar reward offered for his arrest. It's been revealed a secret witness led police to Mockbell's Greek hideout and he's now earmarked for the bounty. Known only as Informant 3030, the man was a key figure in the Mockbell empire but wanted revenge after his brother died of a drug overdose. He gave Mockbell a phone that was bugged by police, which later implicated the convicted criminal in drug production and distribution. Informer 3030 was recruited by Purana in April, just weeks after a $1 million reward for Mockbell's arrest was announced. He was then able to recruit two undercover officers to work alongside the drug lord. Mockbell had been in solitary confinement in the high security Corey Dallas prison on the outskirts of Athens. But he was recently moved to a jail north of the capital where security is more relaxed. Taxpayer funds will be used to pay the reward if Chief Commissioner Christine Nixon approves the request. That at the end of the day will be a recommendation uh, made by the, minister, by the uh, Commissioner for Police to the Minister and uh, that will be a matter for her judgment. Jacqueline Freegard for Nightline. Two men have been arrested over an attempt to blackmail the British royal family. The pair allegedly had videotape of someone from the royal family in a gay sex encounter, but the name of the extortion victim has been withheld by a court order. This was the hotel in London's Mayfair where police arrested the blackmailers in a sting operation last month. A Scotland Yard detective posing as a royal aide went to the hotel to meet the blackmailers. After the screening of a videotape allegedly showing a member of the royal family engaged in a sex act, a team of officers entered the room and arrested two men. In August, they had demanded $120,000 for the tape, as well as evidence the royal had provided cocaine to a member of staff. Police were immediately informed. The handling of the, uh, the, the blackmail allegations is done strictly by the book, by Buckingham Palace. As soon as something like this comes in, they inform the police immediately and then it becomes a police investigation. The accused men, aged 30 and 40, have already appeared at a brief court hearing where the royal's identity was suppressed, though it's believed the target isn't a senior member of the family, ruling out Princes Charles, William and Harry. 
The judge in the case will now have to decide how the victim can give evidence in a trial while still being protected. The two men are due to reappear in court in December. A lawyer for one of them has denied his client's guilt. In London, James Talia for Nightline. Everyone got to walk the red carpet at last night's ARIA Awards, but only a select few made the winners walk up to the stage. For Daniel Johns, that actually meant five trips to collect Silverchair's share of the booty. The ARIAs are much more than just a song about ping pong. It's a song! It's a song about ping pong! But it had its place last night, quirky and different, as was Katie miller Heidke, complete with small boys in leather shorts. Just appearing on the telecast can be more than enough to give an artist serious traction. And winning a category, or in Silverchair's case, an astonishing five categories, means big money in the bank. I think a significant win at the Arias could increase your record sales by 50 or 60,000 units. Their record companies will go out there, they'll put more stock of the album in the shops this week. And Silverchair won Album and Single of the Year, Best Group, Best Rock Album, and Straight Lines was the highest selling single. But Daniel John still didn't want to say anything. I lost in rock, scissor, paper, rock. <laughs> so it's my turn. Keith Urban was gracious, thanking his wife for his Best Country Album Award. Uh, it wouldn't exist without my wife. She was the inspiration for it, so I dedicate this award to you, baby. Thank you. Predictably, Missy Higgins won Best Female Artist. Unpredictably, self-taught drummer-singer Gautier won Best Male. The highlight of the night, a blistering guitar duet by Keith Urban and John Butler. The Butler Trio picked up two awards. Cole Kidman loved it, and so did everyone else. Peter Harvey for Nightline. Well, Nightline Sports News with Stephanie Brands is after the break. Steph, all the weekend's Pura Cup action, given the test selectors plenty to think about. Sure has, Michael. It all ended in a draw between New South Wales and Queensland, but there have been plenty of outstanding individual performances. Today, it was a solid Chris Simpson century, while Stuart Clark starred with the ball. Also coming up, Carlton welcomed their new, rec new recruit, Chris Judd's first training run with the Blues. And the NFL touches down in London. Fans pack Wembley Stadium for a game of gridiron. They came by the busload. I'm here to meet Farmer Gus. Farmer John. Farmer Brad. In Nine's romantic new series. Wow, you took my breath away. Our farmers have rounded up their girls. Now they have a difficult decision to make. Any one of you could easily come to the farm. But there's only going to be two. Which two ladies will make it back to the farm? And what's the shock twist that could break this poor farmer's heart? The brand new series you'll fall in love with. The Farmer Wants a Wife. Wednesday, 7.30. Bacon, 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 make muffin with egg and bacon. Come and taste the bacon at Macca's we're busy making. Bacon and egg McMuffin, a tasty breakfast treat, yeah! <laughs> the saltwater crocodile. It's probably the most dangerous member of the crocodilian family. Oh. I mean, there's an animal out there and it's, it's hunting us. I am getting in the water. We're dealing with an animal. Come on, let's go! Let's go, come on! It's like a vicious dog guarding a piece of meat in his backyard. Pura Cup match between New South Wales and Queensland has ended in a draw, but there have been a couple of outstanding performances that will have the test selectors thinking hard. In the Bulls' second innings, Chris Simpson made 120, while Stuart Clark claimed four wickets. But Stuart McGill worked hard for just one. On a steamy Sydney day, Stuart Clark was steaming in and had the Bulls' batsmen ducking and weaving. Clark claimed the wickets of Broad, Hayden, Ma, and Simons. At one stage, 5 for 138, Chris Simpson steadied the innings and later formed a 208-run partnership with Ashley Nofke. 
in Adelaide, the chairman's 11 eclipsed Sri Lanka's first innings total of 369 to be all out for 409. The match ending in a draw. The entire Muralitharan finished with four for 122 off 44 overs. There were no taunts from the crowd and it's something he claims he doesn't worry about as long as it's not racist. I think ratio will be more bad because you shouldn't say to a person like whatever race you are come from, you're born with it, you, you can't change you or anything and just keep going. But no bowling with people can say whatever they want, their opinion, that's all. Murali also teased the Aussie media about the nine test wickets he needs to go past Shane Warne's world record. There is, I'm not going to stop playing cricket for another two years or three years I'll be playing. So it eventually it's going to come. In Kevin Rudd speak, that's, will he break the record? Yes, he will, but in his own season. Ken Sutcliffe for Nightline. Carlton coach Brett Ratton says Chris Judd remains in the running for the captaincy, even though the star recruit says he's not interested. Judd made his first appearance at Blues training today and there was no shortage of interest. After a much hyped build-up, Carlton's star Eagle had finally landed. So I think it's a bit of a statement to, uh, you know, we're pretty uh, wrapped that he chose us. Recovering from groin surgery, Judd was confined to light skills. The 24-year-old did some running, but there was no number yet on his back. As long as he runs out, he can wear number uh, 00 or 105. It doesn't bother me. After about 40 minutes, Judd's first session was finished. How'd you go, Chris? Went well. But he couldn't escape the spotlight. Oh, Made me get on the phone. How'd you go on the phone? Yeah, hey, I'll do it. How'd you go on the phone? It was day, good. Chris? Light session, so good to get it underway. You groin's OK? Yeah, feeling pretty good. Well, Judd has indicated he doesn't want to captain the Blues next season. Ratton admits he's still in the mix, but a decision on the captaincy won't be made until next year. He'll be in our leadership group, but, uh, you know, there'll be probably six players in that, so out of them six will come a captain. What about the captaincy? You, you said earlier that you weren't looking at it. Any changes? No, no changes. And if Judd was having any second thoughts about leaving West Coast, news of another Eagles nightclub incident will reinforce his decision. The reported fracas between Andrew Embley and serial offender Daniel Kerr was over by the time police arrived. West Coast is taking no action. Christina Hearn for Nightline. There's a bit more spring in the step at Sydney FC after beating the Central Coast Mariners yesterday. A first up win for new coach John Cosmina. Now the club hits the road, aware the next three games might well decide its season. Newcastle Jets, the first hurdle. The only uniform the Sydney players needed today included their bodies and a towel. Their recovery session at Bondi was certainly upbeat. And after new coach John Cosmina helped orchestrate yesterday's win, the players have newfound faith. Possibly the club just needed a bit, a bit of a change, maybe to spice things up a little bit. Sydney's next three games are against Newcastle, Melbourne and Wellington. They could decide any finals aspirations. So I think first half, we obviously we've shown that we can beat anybody in that, that performance. After 13 years with the Broncos, Petro Sivanasiva is now getting used to life as a Panther. Today was a meet and greet with his new teammates. And while he's a long way from the surf and sand, Sivanasiva is treating the move to the mountains as a sea change. I'll leave the safety net of Brisbane, uh, the comfort zone, uh, and, uh, you know, to come down here is going to be a real test for me. Sivanasiva would have preferred not to move, but the Broncos showed him the door, and that's who the Panthers play in round one next year. No doubt it'll be a very, uh, very physical clash and uh, one that I'm looking forward to. And a sellout Wembley crowd has embraced American football in a huge way. Put your hands together for your Miami Dolphins! The Dolphins took on the New York Giants, and half a million people tried to get tickets to the first NFL game played outside of the US. There was little in it. The Dolphins won 13-10. The promotion was a major success, and unlike their normal football crowds, everyone went home happy. NFL should come more often back into England. Clinton Fletcher for Nightline. Great novelty for the fans, but Michael, also a novelty for the athletes. Almost all of them had to apply for their first passports to play in the game. Isn't that amazing? Fantastic. Story. They might also find some new recruits in England, Steph. <laughs> I don't know about that. Did you say new recruits? <laughs> I can say new recruits. I have put my teeth back in. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not. Done. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> Stay with us. Nightline's finance and the weather coming up. And making a song and dance for the school spectacular. <laughs> Tonight on the
the Mint, we're giving one lucky viewer over $100,000. That's right, one person will be drawn at random and will win the entire vault. Stick around and find out after midnight who. Blue Flame Design is a graphic design provider. I'm Louise. And I'm Nicole. And uh, we own the salon together. The incidence of a fire would be quite devastating. Very, very important to have insurance so we don't fall flat on our faces if something does happen. <laughs> It was pretty easy with Allianz because they took the time to understand and listen to what I was after. The price was a really good value to the business. It just covered everything we needed. It's affordable and it's worth it. So call Allianz now on 131000 or contact your broker. You know what really bugs the experts at Oral-B? A regular manual toothbrush can leave more plaque bugs on your teeth. Lots of acid-producing plaque bugs. So they invented Oral-B Vitality, a rechargeable brush under $30. It moves almost 8,000 times a minute and reduces up to two times more plaque than a manual. Plug in Vitality, a rechargeable brush under $30, or try the effective yet gentle cleaning action of new Vitality Sonic from Oral-B, the power toothbrush more dentists use. Eye exercises may look funny, but if performed regularly, they can really help you maintain good eyesight by reducing eye strain from computers. And right now, get frames from just $199. Your eyes will love the eye people. You give me signs that make me wonder. Do you want to be like me or you want to be me? I know I won't get with this one opportunity. I'm not going to spoil. If you have something to confess, you spit it out now. Now to Nightline's finance news, and there was a big jump on the Australian market today. The ASX 200 up 1.4% to 6,792. As usual, Tom Petrovsky joins us now. Tom, the takeover of Jubilee Mines and another fresh high for the Aussie dollar. The big news. It was part of the reason why the resource sector today, Michael, was really on fire. We've seen Extrata, which is the world's fourth biggest nickel miner, say that it will pay $23 per share for Jubilee Mines, which is Australia's fifth biggest uh, nickel miner. So it really does point to a very robust outlook for stainless steel, of which nickel is a key uh, ingredient. So today we saw Jubilee Mines finish higher by an extraordinary 40%. And this is probably not going to be the end of this takeover deal. We'll probably see another company chip their hat in and, uh, um, and make a bid for Jubilee. So it'll be interesting to watch over the course of the next couple of days. But Sally Malay and Western Areas, uh, two other nickel miners, also had substantial gains today. Uh, the Aussie dollar, 23-year highs. It's uh, looking very good. We've got uh, other things happening this week that will pro probably push it higher. Wall Street, Tom, what's happening there? Not much in the way of economic news tonight. Uh, a bit of corporate news around, but the market's really waiting uh, for events later on in the week. We've got growth numbers, jobs numbers, and a US interest rate decision. The uh, left field outcome could be that the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates by half percent midweek, and that will certainly make things interesting if, it, if they do. Okay, Tom, wrap it up with gold and oil, please. Uh, Aussie dollars pulled back a little bit from uh, its highs of the day, uh, 92.2 US cents. Gold is up by about $4 per ounce at $789.50, and uh, oil a little bit firmer at $92.32. Great, Tom. Thanks again. Thanks, Michael. It's weather time now on Nightline. Here's Magella Weemers. Thank you, Michael. A cool change has come across Sydney. It was pretty mild, though, and Tuesday will still be warm and quite humid. More storms are possible for Brisbane. We've got a trough lingering there. We've also got a low south of the country, and that's going to make it quite windy in Hobart. And a weak cold front is likely to give Adelaide some morning falls and throw some showers onto Melbourne late on Tuesday. We can't rule out a bit of wet weather for Perth either. It will be pretty gusty in Alice Springs, dry in Sydney, and a little bit of cloud will stick around in Cairns. Wednesday should be sunny in Canberra, a fine day for Hobart and Melbourne and there could be some showers for Adelaide and some rain for Alice Springs. Now that rain is a sign of things to come in other states because by Thursday there's going to be quite a bit of instability across the interior of the country and the next few days are going to be pretty damp. We'll see some thunderstorms fire up for Adelaide. Sydney could get one late in the piece and some showers for Melbourne and they're likely also for Canberra. It's still early but wet weather wise it does look pretty promising towards the end of the week Michael. Okay, Magella, thank you. Finally, to one of the highlights of the school year for students in New South Wales, something well away from computers and books, the annual school spectacular. This afternoon at the Sydney Entertainment Centre, 1,500 performers got together for the first time to be put through their paces. <laughs> For the shows themselves, they'll be joined by dancers from country schools who got into the act today via a video link. There are four shows in Sydney this year, starting on Friday the 23rd of November. 
That is Nightline for this Monday. Stand by now for the Mint on 9, your local news if you're watching through Win. I'm Michael Usher. Thanks for your company. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. show started. Good Hello morning, Australia. everybody. Welcome you're, to the Mint. You're with Katrina and Lyle this morning. Very exciting morning this morning. It is an extremely exciting morning. I hope you've had a fantastic weekend. I had a great weekend. We had a great weekend. Oh, we, we did. We hung out Played together. by the pool. It was fantastic. Oh, it was awesome. How so was your nice weekend? I thought it was as good as ours. Now, it's about to get a whole lot better, hopefully, because something very exciting is happening. Let's have a look at what our, uh, our jackpot was worth last week, our Mint Vault jackpot. At the end of last week, it was standing at that, $103,301. But we do something a bit special on Mondays. You do? Yes, we do. What do you do? Well, we top the thing up. Is that what we do? Have a look at this. Uh, all the leftover money went into this week's jackpot, which is standing at... $113,601. That is what the jackpot is right now. And of course, good things have to come to an end. Tell everybody what's going to happen tonight, Katrina. What is going to happen tonight that every person that has correctly answered a puzzle on the Mint mm -hmm. and had a crack at opening the vault by giving us a three-digit code on the show was put into a drawer.